the Bible tells us that when he's asking, why do you ask me what my name is? Why, why do you want to know what my name is? Because his name in the Hebrew translated from secret is wonderful. Wonderful. People are big on names, you know. There, there's people that, that stake their whole churches and their teachings and their doctrines on, on a name. They even have a new Bible out now. It's the King James uh, Proper Name Bible. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But it still stems back to the fact that, yes, there were Jews that wrote the Bible, but the New Testament was written in Greek. It was not written in Hebrew. So the same words that you have translated into your King James Bible are the same words that Paul and Peter and John and everybody else wrote down in Greek. So if you change from what they wrote down, then you're changing the Word of God. Right? Believe it or not, Paul called Christ's name Jesus, Christos, the Messiah, the Anointed. That's what Christ means. It doesn't mean something what people try to point up, point it to be, to be meaning. It simply means the Messiah or the Anointed One. And all that were looking for Him knew He had came. The wise men, we've ventured on this a little bit Wednesday night. Why would you suppose three wise men were looking for a king? For a Jewish king at that. Because, beloved, they knew. They were, I, I firmly believe, they were the, the descendants and the remnants left over from Daniel in the captivity of Babylon. And they had made that 700 some odd mile trek to find the anointed because they were looking for him. You know that today there's people have more than ample proof. Everybody's got a Bible. There's one in every house. Most of them's got 15 or 20 Bibles in each house. And people won't pick it up and won't search out Christ. These men got up on their livestock and foot probably most of the way. 700 mile journey to, to find the Messiah for, for the flat out reason of worshiping Him. 700 miles. How many of us won't go out our back doors? You can't swing a cat in Alabama without hitting a church. You can't. You can't. And how many folks will put off going to worship Him because it's not convenient for them? This is, this is not meant to be convicting, but I mean, at the same time, you, you better be glad that you can be convicted. Uh, Brother Kemp made a statement this morning, yes, I'm so thankful to God that I can feel guilty too, and, and that I can, can still feel shamed and still have that tugging on my heart. Because, beloved, if you don't have any conviction, and if you don't have any feeling of your, your guilt, the Spirit of God is not dwelling in you, and He's not working on you to show you your shortcomings. That's a bad place to be. How many people are in that place now? I pray to God that nobody in here is in that place. Uh, Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. We're going to look at uh, one verse here. Maybe two. You know who else come from Bethlehem besides the Messiah? What bloodline was he promised to come from? Amen. Sister Bethany found Micah yet. You find it? She's looking, God bless her. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 tells us, But thou Bethlehem, Euphrates, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Or in other words, beloved, he's always been. He's always been. Why Jerusalem? Let me see if I can find you a passage here. In Maybe I cannot. Now here it is. First Samuel sixteen. First Samuel sixteen. Blessed be the Lord. Amen. This is a freebie. It's just bonus scripture here. But uh, I thought this was pretty cool. You know, Christ was promised. King David was told from from your loins there's going to be a king that reigns forever. Guess where he was from? Of Bethlehem. Amen. Look at this, beginning in verse 1. 1 Samuel 16, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said unto Samuel, Samuel was the priest for Israel in those days, he said, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, 
seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Jesse we know was King David's daddy. For I have provided me a king among his sons. Now, here Samuel was told to go to, to the Bethlehemite or in Bethlehem and find Jesse. And we all know the story. Jesse took all of his sons except for King David and paraded them before him. And Saul was like, no, nah, something's missing. you got to have another kid. And sure enough, King David was out there tending to the flock. And that's where he was called in from. And it's amazing that all those years later that a flock of shepherds would be the first ones to announce the Messiah is coming. Fast forward to the, to uh, actually, go to Galatians 4 real quick. Because we're going to want to establish the fact that it's nothing new and, and there's, there's never been anything overlooked about Christ coming. It, what does every other religion have a, a problem with? With the Godhead. They can't understand the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. They, they don't get that. They don't understand how God could be made flesh. Verse 4 of Galatians 4. If you don't have this verse highlighted, highlight this verse or underline it. This is one that needs to be underlined. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman and made under the law. And not only was He made under the law, but He was made, He fulfilled all the law. That does not negate the law, beloved. When the Bible tells you thou shalt not kill, how many of you know you should not kill? You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. Those are all sins that you should not do. And you should... With all that lies in you, try to live up to that. Try to live up to that. There, there's nothing uh, negating the grace or the gospel of Christ by walking holy. In fact, it's the opposite. If you do walk holy and try to live holy, your lives are going to be blessed more, more so than if you... Because you can go back through. There's blessings and cursings that goes with all the Word of God. And if you do not do the things God tells you to do, there's cursings that follows them. Punishment... And your everlasting life has nothing, nothing to do with one another. Christ paid your penalty for sin. But Christ paid your penalty for sin. You don't crucify Him every day. When you violate and when you trespass against God and against His holy ordinances, you're violating against God and you're going to pay for your sin. You'll pay for it a lot of times right then and there. Some folks go in and rob a bank, they never make it out of there. They're killed on the spot. They paid for their sin right then and there, regardless of what state their soul was in. So you see how you can disassociate your grace and, and, and your sin and the consequences it has now? An alcoholic will die of cirrhosis of the liver because he won't quit drinking. He can be saved, but he won't bring his body under subjection. It's the same thing, children of God, whatever your, your case may be. Whatever your case may be. In Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to touch on these, these magi. As, as I stay, started this message with today... If you do not realize that today is Christ, it's not Christ's birthday, you need to know that. Okay? Today is not Christ's birthday. Now, at the same time, we know that life starts at conception. For those of you that are here Wednesday night, the conception did take place, to the best we can tell, give or take a few hours, on December 25th. So this day is very significant and very special. But I want to start a trend. I was telling the people that's here Wednesday, we're going to start celebrating Christ's birth when it was, in September. And some people say that it was on the other cycle and that it was actually in March and, and try to put his crucifixion on his birthday. Well, it could have been. Uh, I, it's just not how it traces out to me. Did anybody look up the Bethlehem star? Did anybody do that? Nobody did that? You couldn't find anything on it? It's pretty awesome. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome to watch that. Matthew chapter 2 talks about the visit of the Magi. It says, When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And I have to interject there. If they weren't Jewish, how would they know anything about the king of the Jews? And why would they be looking for? You know, you've seen all the, in all their, their little pageants and plays, they'll have a black man and an Asian man. and Now, nah, they were more than likely all Jewish. Because anybody else would not be looking for a Jewish king. I mean, that's easy enough for y'all to grab that, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of like the, the fruit in the garden. Everybody assumes it's an apple. Or everybody assumes the Bible doesn't tell us what it is, right? Or how many did Noah take upon the ark? I'll let you going to say two of each. 
Yeah. Right. See, seven of a lot, right? But verse 6 says, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come 